Hello and welcome to the Help My Unbelief podcast, the number one Christian podcast designed for the unbeliever. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 72. 14. 72? 72. Ah, uh, we're glad to be back, man. It feel you know, it, did, it didn't take that long for us to get back in here again. It didn't feel like it was that long. Mm-hmm. I'm sure to the audience it feels a little bit longer, but. I got a verse to start the day with. Okay. It's the one with that goes with my shirt. I'm going to sing. Fear is a liar. Hit me with your It says, shot. it's Psalms 23, 4. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Very good. Very good. What else on the fear? If fear he, is a liar, but also fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear a of the Lord. Fear. Mm-hmm. fear of the Lord. Yep, that's right. And F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. It's yes. a liar. Very good. I like it. Um. So I was trying to figure out what that clip was. My ADD took over. Sorry. We're just, we're going to put that up for right now. So how have you been? How have I been? Yes. Get um, that out of your hand before you start playing with it. I just wanted to jump into something like straight off the bat and get vulnerable here. Um, because Coco and I have been going through pretty, you know, I know we. I came in here pretty old, hopped up on Mountain Dew and I was excited because we had been. Um, out witnessing the Lord doing miracles, and it, it takes Mountain Dew to hype you up. It was, I mean, I get hyped up on Jesus, I, brother. I was gonna say I actually don't drink Mountain Dew, but I have been getting. <laughs> I've drank like two Mountain Dews in the last. Oh, that's month. wrong. Yeah, it's probably not good for you, but it's fine. Well, that's the beginning of kidney stones. We as, found that out in as class Pastor on Kevin would say, YOLO. So he said YOLO a couple Does times. He, from the pul- he said it a couple times from the pulpit. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I say that too, but I mean, it's like a generational gap here. I don't know. Oh. Like, when do you stop saying YOLO? You know, at some point you got to stop saying yeah. it. <laughs> what but is that? YOLO, it says, stands for you only live once. It's <laughs> an acronym for yeah. you only live once, YOLO. It's like the B-O-G-O, BOGO, buy one, get one. Yeah, you are really showing your age <laughs> no. right now. I mean, bad. No, I mean, I just learned that at Coles. You didn't day. know what YOLO, YOLO no, meant? No, I have no idea what No, that I didn't meant. either. I didn't either. Got to admit. Yay! Got to admit. Yeah. Old dudes. The old dudes. I old. bet you are excited. You got a fellow um, fellow old man here with you. Yes. Huh? I, we, I, We're not just ganging up on you now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use a lot of the language that they have no clue what it means. Yeah. yeah. And you... There you You're go. there. Yep. You know what it means. Yep. Yep. You guys can just randomly say debauchery every now and then. Oh. Just every now and then, like, excuse me? Every no, time I, I ain't said debauchery, he <laughs> thought it was a bad word. No. <laughs> anyway, uh. um, so it's something I wanted to talk about because I just, throughout these episodes, I've always been honest about my walk. And I had, honestly, last month, I just had a really good month. And we had, and this month hasn't been the greatest month. Um, and we've talked to a few people in it and kind of gathered some thoughts on it, but you I know last time we talked about how we, we, me and him had went on a trip and we had prayed for a, um, a young lady. So in the, in the unbeliever community, community, people we've ministered to, um, through this, um, podcast before we traveled a long distance to go pray for somebody that was on hospice. Um, this person is not doing well, um, physically and all that stuff. And we went and prayed for them. And, um, I'm telling you, I've never felt the Holy Spirit on me on the way down there he could feel the same thing i was very emotional it was just very i was very charged i genuinely believed that god was going to perform a miracle and completely restore and heal this girl you know and i was so excited i mean angela got baptized with the holy spirit while we were praying she was across the country and she it just coincident. I, well, it's not a coincidence, obviously, but she got baptized of the Holy Spirit the same time that we were praying in there. And if we were connected and it was just such a crazy move, I felt God talking to me. Um, I know when we left, like, you know, you, everybody knows I have a little bit of like control issues and stuff like that. 
And of course, whenever I left there, my mind started kind of gravitating towards that control again. I'm like, oh man, because I had heard some witches and some pagans were going to go down there and, you know, and pray for that person as well. And I was like, oh no, what if witches come here and they bring something with them? And all, you know, and I started thinking about this. And I felt God stop me, and I felt I heard him say, I'm there now. Like, stop. I'm there now. And whatever he meant by that, I knew that I didn't have to worry anymore because he was there. It gave you peace. Gave me peace. About It stopped those controlling thoughts instantly. Haven't had a single one since. I'm like, okay. You know, because I felt God tell me to grab a, a, an, an item from a store and to anoint it with oil, told her about it, and I gave it to her. Um, and prayed over it and stuff like that. We prayed a lot before we got there and stuff like that. And um, and just ever since we've gotten back, we've just been in a really dark place and really couldn't understand why. Um, didn't really have any thoughts to it. It's not. I'm not doubting my faith. Would you say you're doubting your faith either? Um, Maybe a little. It's definitely not as strong as it was just you know a month or two ago. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, I, f- I find myself kind of going back to those old thought patterns where, like, I have to kind of just tell myself, "Hey, you know, stop. You know, this is, you know, you believe this now, type thing. Lean into it a little bit." But I catch myself getting into those old thought patterns and really gotta, really gotta catch myself on it. Yeah. I do but, too. But isn't isn't uh, Pastor Gary? Mm-hmm. Isn't that exactly what the Bible tells you to do? He captures his thought, mm-hmm. and he rebukes them. Mm-hmm. Brings it in captivity. Right? You, yeah. That's yeah. exactly what Paul tells us to do. So he's saying that he thinks it got worse after he just got baptized. Yeah, that was, I got baptized right around the same time. I don't remember, do you remember the date we went down there um, when we went? Cause it was a couple weeks after we got back, right? The baptism? Mm-hmm. No, it was I want to say it was like oh, it was before. With, like, I want to say like a couple days. Yeah. Like we got back and then yeah, or within a week of us okay. getting back. So it was all kind of around the same time. And then so he felt like the spirit was moving really in his life. Like he he felt God giving him dreams, visions, stuff like that. And then after we did this, it just went away. And I know for me, after I've sat down and thought about it, but I've been in a real dark place. And what I mean by dark is not like you know I'm. I'm not like going to hurt myself or or anything like that. And I'm actually, I'm not back where I was, where I'm like, I want to get out of here. Sometimes I get in a place where I'm like, man, this just stinks. I don't understand. Sometimes I don't understand why I feel like God is playing secret squirrel with us. Like why he has to, why he has to send us out there. And it's got to be like this big secret. And like, why can't you just tell us what to do? We'll do it. Tell us what you're going to do. And I know he can't tell us everything. I for sure would mess it up. But, like, I just really, I expected something to happen that didn't happen, and I know that's not healthy when you're following God. What you're explaining is ministry, period. Mm. You know, and the first question would be, were you in God's will when you went? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, did you know you were doing what God wanted you to do? Yeah. Yeah. And see, the thing is, is we're not responsible for the results. We're responsible for the obedience. And, the, you know, like right now, I'm preaching every Sunday at a, at a church that's in between pastors. And I'm right where God wants me to be. I, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, God wants me doing this. He wants me there. And I'm not the one held responsible for the results of my ministry. If people are, and I thank God that someone was saved this week and three were the week before. But at the same time, I go, I represent the Lord. I present what God's given me, and then I leave. And then the reality is God's responsible for what happens. I don't save anyone. I don't heal anyone. You know, the healing is not your responsibility. You don't do it. But all you do is by faith. Can I give you? Can I give you a scenario and then ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I got to set this up for him because he wasn't here when this happened. So, because I want to ask this question and how you felt now, and I probably know how you felt now, but maybe, I'm going to, anyways, I'm going to put this scenario out there. So Pastor Gary, like a a year ago, um, had went, so he travels around um, ministering and and taking over preacher positions for churches that maybe have lost a pastor or or something happened and they need a pastor and they transition in between pastors and he goes. 
Well, he went to this town called Lone Grove um, about a year ago, probably at this point. And you were there for a really long time, right? Two months. He was there for a really long time and was really praying. And you got really connected to that church. You were mm-hmm. really connected and, and you felt a personal connection to that mm-hmm. place. And then they finally... I'm sure you were excited when they finally got that pastor, but then they just lost it him again, right? Like yes, and it's where I'm at now. El, is Elk City? Oh, it was Elk City. It wasn't yes. Lone Grove. No. Okay. No. So my question to you is, is because I'm sure right now that doesn't discourage you. You can probably, I can probably answer that question for you. That right now you're not discouraged, but do you think 20 years ago it would have? If you were doing the same ministry 20 years ago that you're doing now, and you were believing in God to fill that pastoral position. He did. And then you thought that was the one that God anointed and they would have left. Do you think you would have been discouraged at some point in your ministry or, cause I look at that and go, Oh man, that would have just really I've made me feel defeated. You know, really, I go back to the thing that I really don't hold myself responsible for, um, the outcome. Okay. Uh, I can't because the, uh, res- God's got complete authority, and God has complete responsibility. Uh, and honestly, I have neither. All I do, I'm a servant, represent him. I do what I'm supposed to do. And then after I do that, fulfill my role, my responsibility, then my hands are off of it. And it's what he does. And like, for example, this church that, that we're talking about, um, the family had another direction. The wife got another job. The and directed her, and they were there less than two years. And now I'm back at the same church. And God's got a good plan for the church. Yeah. And and me personally, I see, and, and I think everybody else has seen this, God moves in a lot of different ways. And we have this tendency to want to put God in a box, and I want him to move like this every time so he's predictable, and so I can understand it, and then I can allow that to be the foundation that my faith grows upon the next time the next box and and it's always predictable and and we don't want that small a god because i don't want to limit god to my box okay i want god to do what god wants to do how god wants to do it and all i'm going to do is my part my role yeah because that person getting completely healed may have been even smaller than what what god wants to do there and there's no telling yeah, and because, so, because again, it goes back to uh, Sunday was the anniversary of the funeral of that thirteen-year-old girl that we prayed for to be healed, and she wasn't. And then her funeral, uh, we had her funeral, and man, there was dozens of people accepted the Lord uh, at her funeral. So, you know, we see things from our perspective. God sees things from His perspective, and the, His perspective is He knows the end from the beginning, mm-hmm. so He knows everything. And so he knows where he wants to take it. He knows what he wants to do. All I'm responsible for is my role, okay? And I represent him. I do what he tells me. And then the results is up to him. It's just immaturity on our part. I'm going to tell you, it is the way that, you're, from your perspective, that, that responsibility that you feel and, and not having that, that, that's putting more pressure on you than what you really need, you know, because... And that that would burden you down, that would get you depressed. And, and that's kind of like Elijah uh, after Mar- Mount Carmel, you know, 450 prophets of Baal. And next thing you know, he's in a cave wanting to die because the reality is, is Jezebel was after him and now here comes depression. And so the thing that you've got to do is relieve yourself of that responsibility because you're yeah. not the healer. You know, you know you're not the healer. Uh, I'm not the healer, I'm not the one that saves, and I'm not the provider. And so that just takes a whole lot of responsibility off of me. Just to serve it. Yeah, that's it. And you have no clue. That's We did not go in there with the expectation of, God, whatever you want to do here, you wanted us to come down here, whatever you wanted to do, like, just do it, and we're just here. We did not go in with that mentality. We went in, like, with the mentality of, we want the scroll to heal. And I'll tell you, you know? the thing that impressed me in the whole story <clears throat> is that you were willing to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, to me, that was the battle. You know, making up your mind to go, and we're going to go represent the Lord, and we're going to go into the this uncomfortable situation, and even there, we're going to go and represent the Lord. 
to me, that was a spiritual victory. It was, went. and I got to say this to encourage you, like what you did was way more bold than what I did. I'm a minister. This is what I'm supposed to do. Like, this is exactly what I'm, I'm expected and supposed to do what I did there. But what you did with the circumstances, who it was and your past with them, I was sitting there watching you and I had told him before, I was like, we went back for day two and I said, I want, I want you to pray for her tomorrow. And then I watched him and he started making moves because he was going to do it. And I could tell he was super uncomfortable and I didn't bail him out because he was uncomfortable, but I started thinking to myself, I was like, wow, this is like crazy. I can't tell of all the circumstances of what makes it so crazy on air. Maybe I'll tell you later, but I've told you before, but it was very bold of what, of what he did. Yeah. It was, it was far more bold than me. I'm supposed to do this stuff. You weren't supposed to do that. So, and see, to me, the vi- you, you have the victory, both Coco and you. You've got your victory. You did what God told you to do, and now you give it to him, and then the outcome is his will. We were protected. Nothing yeah. bad happened. I got to see the ocean for the first time in my whole life, so that was really cool. I mean, by the time I got there, I was just completely um, exhausted, and so I couldn't really enjoy it, but um, it was like, man, it was it was a cool experience. We got to do it, and I would do it again. But next time, we just, it's just immaturity on our part. We're just immature ministers. Like, we just no, got to mature. It's not that. It, it really isn't. It, it is something that we all go through. It is how we handle it. Right? What is, oh, that's Pastor Gary. That I was like, fine. what is that? Sorry. That sounds like an emergency. I've, I've got it <laughs> off. Yeah. Um, but yeah. That's a grandson. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, I I get it, but we just need to temper our expectations next time. That's really all it is is expectations, you know. No, what you have to remember is what Pastor Gary just said: the victory was in the obedience. Mm-hmm. That was your only responsibility was to obey. It, would there be a reason why, like, when we get back from that and we're hearing from God, lest we feel less spiritual, um, or like? I know there's a lot of things tied into feeling, but there's a reason why we're so drained and stuff like that. Cause I know, I know for a fact that there's no way that nothing, I, I'm not going to subscribe to that mindset that some demonic got attached to us and stuff like that. We're protected. We're sons of God. I do not want to subscribe to that. I know that didn't happen, but like, is there a reason why our spirituality? I know one reason we were coming back that night and we knew we needed to go to that men's class that night. And we were, coming trying to make it back but um we we just got back too late to where we couldn't so i know we need to be refilled and we didn't get refilled for like another week like wednesday we didn't get it and so that that could be a part of the problem but why i mean we could yeah you do it yourself right i get it but it's just i don't know i guess it's not the same unless you're around brothers because we you know we wanted to talk about it we were really trying to move to drive all the way from alabama we drove through an area that got hit with a with tornado, a tornado and we had we had people just stopping and gawking. I think is what they wow. say. They were just yeah. nothing was going on in the road. They were yeah. just places where buildings were blown down and traffic was stopped on the highway, so people could look at houses that were blown down or factories or you know whatever it was. That yeah. we drove through. you know how aggravating that is for true Okies. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things about ministry, though, is that you're responsible for your own spiritual condition Mm -hmm. you are. And the more you give out, the more you've got to be in your private time with God. Definitely. You've got to have that personal, private, alone time with God in in his presence. Um, You you can't, if you try to minister without having a personal intimacy with God, then it becomes fake. Yeah, Um, you're dead in the water. You are. You are. And it's critical daily. Uh, you've you've got to have daily time alone with God. You know, you've got to. It's critical. You're a runner, okay? Can you just run continuously? What? No. No. You have to stop and and you have to service your body and give it rest, right? Yep. Why do you not think that you have to do that with your soul as well? That's the same spirit? thing. I mean, it's the same as a race. So yeah. Yeah. I mean that we we have to. Like like Gary was pointing out, to be able to pour out, you have to be poured in. Mm-hmm. And if you aren't around somebody that can, 
Good grief. Put on some praise music. Mm -hmm. Get in the presence of God. Usher the presence of God in. I mean, just a small song of, you know, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Just a couple of verses of that, and he, the Holy Spirit comes, and then let him school you. Yeah. You know, that's why, that, that's why that morning time is crucial. And your morning time, you know, I know that you have been stale in your morning time. All right? You haven't been calling me, so I don't know. But... I still, I, that's one thing I haven't really changed. It's probably not as much as it used to be, but I still, no matter how. Idle ups, hands are the devil's playthings. No matter how, no matter how mad or upset I've been, I've still, I've still tried to keep that, even though I might be sitting there going, you know, I still go through that routine of it, you know, but my attitude hasn't been the greatest with it. Don't make does it that a, make sense? Don't like, make it, it a routine. Does. It does. And there is such thing as spiritual fatigue. Yeah. You know, just, and there is such a thing, especially as you, when you've been a Christian for a number of years and you do the same thing over and over and over. The thing you don't want to do is make it just a ritual and a rut. Yeah. Uh, you want to keep it fresh. You want to keep it new. Uh, you want to try new things that you've never, like you are right now, like we all are with this podcast, that, you know, do yep. something different and put yourself in a different environment and different challenges. And yeah. Yeah. And everything draws you closer to the Lord. The enemy, his tactic is to use anything he can to bring discouragement. Mm -hmm. And that's his ultimate goal. He wants to discourage, kill, steal, and destroy. And so he wants to do anything and everything that he can do to bring discouragement. You're crazy if you think that bold move that you made up there, you showed the enemy what you're willing to do. Mm -hmm. And you're crazy to think that he's not going to come at you. And that's it. Hard. So true. You know what I mean? Uh, probably not. I mean, not, we listen to Caleb still like you. Yeah. Before I was, before I even became a Christian, Angela challenged me to just listen to gospel music, yeah, like replace all the music I yes. listened to with gospel for a certain amount of time. Right. She challenged me 30 for day a challenge. month and like, I mean, you've said it before too. That's, yeah. that's what it's been on. Yeah. Like it, it's been four or five months now and that's oh nice. all we li like. We even listened to it. We talked a lot on the way down there, um, but we had Caleb running in the background. I downloaded the app so we didn't have to keep searching for stations. Oh, uh, so I, I, I wish I'd have known how to do that in truck driving world. <laughs> yeah, I had yeah. to go find we, it. We all talked the time. pretty much all the way down uh, there, but we didn't do much talking on the way back. When <laughs> I, I, I don't know that that this counts or anything. I, I've got to have some noise when I go to sleep at night. Um, so I actually I put my bone conducting headphones in. Zach loves those. Um, <laughs> but I've got Nerdy. this, I've got this Bible that I've downloaded, um, oh, very good. on audible. Very good. Um, it's just the new Testament, but it's, it's very like soft spoken and it's easy to fall asleep. Very to. Good. So I actually fall asleep, you know, listening to Matthew or John or, you know, something. See, the more that you can do, the better, Yeah, right. the more the better. And that's what awesome. I mean. Like I've still, I've, I've been. My attitude, I still listen to the Bible. I still listen to only Christian content. I still do all that. It's just the only thing that's changed since then is my attitude about it. Yeah. yeah. Every time the enemy gets you alone, he whispers. Yeah. And the whispers can be heard because you're alone. Yeah. You, um, we don't have to be around other Christians to get refilled. Yeah. That's what, that's what is important in the self maintenance. Yeah. That's a lot easier for a new Christian to to get refilled around other Christians. Yeah, that it's, yeah. well, I agree. <laughs> I I agree completely. I, I do. I, I do understand that, I, but I will I'll agree with the old guy. Uh -huh. uh, I'll agree with Larry. And, and the, like last week, I was talking to a Christian, having had a counseling session, and he's suicidal. And in talking with him, he's lost all hope, and battling injury on two narcotics and lives with pain and just cannot get deliverance from the pain. And I challenged him, you know, and he's a believer. And the challenge I had is, is that I want him for one week, every morning, the first thing he does when he gets up is to go into his private place and just spend time with God. And, and I said, be honest with God, tell God I'm mad at you. Tell God I have no faith. Tell God I'm right now hopeless. I'm an addict stuck on two narcotics every day, popping pills. Just be 
brutally honest because the thing is God already knows. But what God wants is his transparency, his honesty, and his open. I can't make it without you. I, I'm, I'm going to kill myself if I don't get some hope here. You see what I mean? And that transparency, that honesty and openness with God, that's where we get our breakthrough. Because then, then in, in that personal, private, intimate openness with God, God can there minister. Because the Holy Spirit will mm-hmm. come into that setting in that honesty and openness, and that's where he will minister. That's why recently I just, I was praying to God. I was like, I was like, you got to do something. This roofing industry is just, it's not for me. Like, I can't stand it. I'm not fulfilled. And I know, you know, I used to be in law enforcement. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's one thing I can say I love. I love doing it. But I ran. I came through some trou- troubles, and I ran from it. And I vowed to never go back. It caused me a lot of trauma, you know. Um, and here recently, I was like, God, you got to do something. And then a couple days later, I felt this ping for me to go back to law enforcement. And then I just was invigorated with this desire to go back. I don't know what's going to happen from it, but, you know, if it is God wanting me to, I'm putting it in. And I, I said, God, if this is you, open the door. I will walk. I'll throw the badge back on. I'll do it. Angela Angela wants to run the company. She still loves the company, what it stands for. And I do, too. I love the I love the the the, the logo. I love the name. I love that that the angel, the story. You know, you mm-hmm. were personally involved with mm-hmm. naming, you know, the company and. I love I love what it stands for, but the industry itself it just takes from me, takes it out of me more than law enforcement ever was. And I was talking to a buddy today, and it kind of brought it pretty clear to me, like where my heart's at. And I he we brought up these two button this button situation, and I said if there was two red buttons on the wall, and one of the buttons was hey. If you push this button, you got to go into that room. There's a guy in the gu- with a gun in there, and he don't want to come out. And you got to go in that room and go get him. But if you push this button, you have to go talk to an insurance agent. Which one would you push? I thought I pushed that one with the guy with the gun all day. Hmm. And it's not because it's not because I'm suicidal or I want to die or, or anything else like that. But that's my that's my safety zone. You know what I mean? That's what fulfills me. That's what mm-hmm. makes me feel. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm not crazy. I'm not psycho. None of that. But that's what gets my motor going. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But whenever you tell me I have to go talk to an insurance agent, I go, oh my, I don't want to do that. Like, it just, ma- it kills me on the inside, you know? I can't stand it anymore. It makes my stomach turn when I think about doing this. Mm-hmm. Every day, it kills me a little bit more. I hope it's God because I, I can't stand it. I can't. I, I'm just being honest. I can't stand this industry mm-hmm. anymore. And it sounds like God's leading you. It yeah. does. It, to me, that's perfect. The way you explain that, that's God leading you. Well, I hope so. I hope so because we got to do something. And Angela, you know, I, t- I, I told her today, I said, hey, we're going to switch roles. You're going to be my boss. I'm going to be your cheerleader. I'm going to give you the boy. She put her shoulders back she said let's go and i said okay hold on <laughs> go girl hold on don't <laughs> not this week <laughs> she will she will too she'll she'll do a great job man that's that's, that's why great. i said that she's real hard on herself she's mentioning her attitude and stuff like that she she's just she's so even tempered and when she says she's like i'm so sorry i've been hard to deal with lately i'm like what are you talking about like yeah. i'm the one that's hard to deal with yeah. can you not see this like she's very even tempered and good so i don't know that's a good Sign talk up. how do you feel about that do you feel encouraged by uh yeah a little i mean there's still some stuff that i don't know i may talk to somebody a little more privately about yeah that i don't know that we need to blast over the air but um yeah but yeah that i mean that helps that helps it yeah yeah it's it helps me too and i, I kind of learned too that there's just it it's going to be painful along the way it's going to hurt sometimes like some things aren't going to go your way or the way that you think and you got to learn to just you know Back when we first kind of started this thing, you asked me why, you know, I'm always, I do my best to always be here at church on something. And some of the things I don't want to do, you know, I don't enjoy nearly as much. But every time I, I'm doing something in the ser- in service of God, I'm getting filled. It, yeah. It looks like I'm putting out, but I'm actually getting filled. And 
when I first came to the Lord, it was, it was difficult to, to let go of all the stuff that I used to do. And I found my strength in going and helping others, going and helping others. Yeah. We have a lot of people in this church that are in need of something, you know, just anything. I mean, it might be a widower that just wants somebody to come by the house and, and visit for 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't take much to find those people. Yeah. Everybody's hurting and needing something. Yeah. And we make our deal bigger than set, everybody else's. Set your si- yourself aside and go do something for someone else to glorify the kingdom of God. Yeah. And you want to start talking about getting, you know, your chart, you get charged from going and praying for people. Yeah. Well, that's a ministry in itself. Yeah. We do need to start doing that again. We haven't done that in a couple of weeks. And that re- that really did fill me. Like, I don't know why I know that's pouring out in ministry, but that really did fill me up going out and praying for people. And, and that's where you get to see when you see God move, that's encouragement for you. Definitely. You know, when you see that Muslim family restored, that, that encouraged me. Definitely. Like that's fuel for, that's what I told him. I was like, I might, I may not ever need to be encouraged about anything ever again. <laughs> like that was so amazing, yeah. you know? So it, it, that encourages us to keep going, but you, you got to put yourself in the fire. You're not going to, you know, it's, it's never going to happen. You're not going to see that kind of stuff. There's a constant pouring out in ministry. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a great teaching about the river of God and uh, Ezekiel 47, uh, Revelation 22. Uh, it tells about a river that flows from the throne of God and then Ezekiel saw the same river flowing out of the temple. And then in John chapter 7, Jesus said that out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And so all of that is the same thing, and it's all making reference to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the presence of God that flows from his throne to you, us. And okay, then from you. And then it flows through us. Okay, Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And so it's this living water that flows through us. And what we have to recognize is we don't build a dam. We don't build a reservoir. We allow it to flow through us. But we've to be able to have it to go from us, we have to have a constant supply coming into us, okay, for it to be a constant flow. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you know, I, I need more of the Holy Spirit every day and i need to be refilled every day with the presence of god and and have that constant flow because it is again it's it's a constant moving flowing of god's presence okay Mm -hmm. and and we have to be refilled to be able to pour out yeah Uh, a little bit of encouragement um i had a an atheist reach out to me from that that clip that went viral um, had an atheist reach out to me and he just laid it out there for me. He was like, man, I'm an atheist, but I feel this pull. Like I, I really want to try this God thing again. Well, and I don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? And I just said, man. Um, and I gave him this generic answer of like, I, I need you to pray and stuff like this. And he goes, he basically said, I need a little bit more than that. I said, okay, you want, you want specifics? I said, I want you to go into a deep prayer. I want you to get off social media completely for seven days. I felt God kind of guide me what to tell. I want you to get off social media completely for seven days. And I want you to go into time for prayer. Basically what you're doing is you're fasting something you love to do. And you're going to go into prayer and you're going to ask God what he wants you to do. Same thing I asked you to do and have an open heart to that. And he said, you know what? I'll do it. I'll see you in seven days. So he's currently doing that right now. So we have another atheist, we don't know, across the country somewhere that is desperate for a relationship with God and reached out to this ministry. So so good. You know, and it's good to hear that stuff that we're doing stuff. Sometimes we're just talking in these mics and we're just all sitting here patting each other on the back. But it is reaching people. Very so good. Good job, everybody. We're time to go? Five minutes. We got five minutes. So yeah, that's encouragement. Um, sometimes when we talk to the atheists and stuff, we don't see, you know, it mm-hmm. reaching the community it's intended for. Mm-hmm. But does anybody have hairspray and a lighter? Oh, whoa! And a ACDC soundtrack? <laughs> no, man. I just, I just want to. Fly. I want to fry this fly. <laughs> well, if you're gonna do that, then we gotta have some back in black playing in the background, man. No, we can't play that on here. That's bad. 
All right, Lowell, let's go ahead and get to the caller today. Do we have a do I have an intro for them? Is his name is Eric, right? And he is an atheist, agnostic, agnostic atheist, probably. He just says what he, atheist. What he said, just his his answer was atheist. So just straight pick up him. atheist. Pick, yeah, ask him. He'll he'll know. Okay. Sure. Well, let's get to him. <laughs> let's get to him, Eric. Hello, Eric. Yes. What's up, brother? It's Zach from Help My Unbelief. Yes. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Um, I don't know if I've already asked how you're doing, so I'm not going to ask it again. Did I ask oh, how you're doing yeah, already? Okay, I did. Okay. I didn't yeah, want to be awkward. Yeah. No, you're absolutely <laughs> fine. Trust me. I don't get awkward. Oh, right on. We'll get awkward together. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's what's up. Okay. Um, man, first of all, thank you for coming on the show. Um, we appreciate uh, the fact that you're coming on. I know these conversations can be very difficult sometimes. Um, but I assure you, you're safe with us. Everything's going to be fine. Um, this show yeah. is um, not intended to, de to debate. We are not a debate platform. We're, we basically want to get your story. Um, we started yeah. this show basically just to, um, we saw a lot of Christian debate platforms out there, and we just don't think that it's serving a, um, a purpose. Maybe it is, but it's just not the purpose that we want to serve. And so I'm going to read this mission statement to you real quick. Um, this is our mission of the show and how we, um, how we kind of expect the conversation to go. And then yeah. I'm going to um, introduce everybody um, in the room to you, okay? Sounds good to me. All right. Our mission is to provide uh, the unbeliever with an environment that is safe from judgment or ridicule without allowing the belittling of God, having the ultimate intent of representing Christ to the unbeliever. So that's our ultimate goal is we want to represent Christ appropriately to you. Um, and then, okay, so how the show's going to go is it's just going to be like an open open conversation um, for the next, you know, 30, 45 minutes or so. And then we do something called the rounds. And what that is is we go around the room and we all say something short and closing. And then because you're our guest, you're going to get the last statement of the rounds segment. Um, okay, so we're going to go around the room. Um, I've got Coco here. Hey, Eric, how are you? Living the dream, brother. Living the dream. I got Angela. Hello. I got, How's it I got Larry. How are you doing, Eric? I got Pastor Living Gary. Hi, Eric. This going? is Gary. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And then my name is Zach. So nice to meet you. Coco said he might um he might know you from that he uh Coco used to be an atheist. He's an ex atheist. I don't know what you uh, I think is ex atheist. He said that he might he, yeah. uh, you you might know each other? Maybe. Uh I've been around I I got friends all over in the community. So. Oh That's really? What I was going to say he's one he was one of the big dogs. Like I know who he is, but I was just I was just a little peon. He probably doesn't know me. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I I I'm I'm around. I I have a lot of friends in the community, but I discuss a lot of like uh science stuff and like that too and so I like I debate, but I I also like to have conversations. I'm not a screamer yeller. I don't like to uh degrade people. Gotcha. You you it, I know I've seen some of those lives and some of the Christians that come on there. I know they make it difficult to be nice, but um but oh, I, yeah. I promise you, we're not the ones. We're not your drunk Uncle Carl that read his Bible one time 10 years ago and then, you know, yeah. decide to get wild and go, go on a TikTok live. But, um, okay, I want to get a little bit about uh, your past a little bit. Do, were you raised? Well, first of all, we were kind of asking this in the intro and uh, interrupt to you. Are you an agnostic atheist or are you just a straight up atheist? I'm a straight up atheist. Okay. Um, that's kind of that's kind of rare. Have we had a straight up yeah. atheist on the show? Mm, I don't know. I don't think so. Most of them, I think most of them will say claim agnostic. agnostic yeah. yeah, most say agnostic, and uh, I actually do believe most people need to say agnostic. I the reason I say I am a hard atheist is one, I a lot of it was from philosophical discussions with a lot of people I know, and they just finally said, "Do you think that there is a?" possibility of these of a god existing i go no not really and so they go well then you're just really a hard atheist you're adding this agnostic to it and instead just discuss your position and explain it instead of just saying i don't know and so that people you can actually explain your ideas instead of just doing this i don't know position since you know your your own and so that's when i just said you know I, i'm okay with that and i i think most people 
when they become atheists, they look at they like they look at the Bible and say, "I don't believe the Bible, so therefore I'm an atheist." And I think that I tell people, I go, "The Bible could be wrong, and God still exists." So I don't think that that's a even good justification to be an atheist. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what was your background like? Did you grow up atheist? Did you grow up Christian? Which what what uh, were you? I grew up in a Catholic household. I even went to like. I was an altar server boy, but I really didn't believe after that age around 12. So I really don't remember if I believed before that, but there's just, it just never set right for me. So I always just say, say it's easier for me just to say I was atheist. But I did get raised in a Catholic household. 12 is a very young age. Did, so did you start having questions at 12 or would you say like you completely was like, Oh, I don't believe this at 12. Yeah. I, the only thing I remember, and this is probably what really got me going, is that I was a Catholic in the South, and I would we would have people put stuff in our uh, our car window saying that we were going to go to hell for being Catholic, and oh. I was just like, "But isn't this the same God?" And so then I started that. I think that started uh, that. I remember asking questions. I don't remember if I ever really believed or not. But I just remember I was like, if this was a case that this was the same God and these people are like putting hateful things on our thing, then would this be an acceptable thing for a God? And it really set wrong with me. And then I started reading the Bible and I started getting into raw science and stuff. But yes, it was it was around that time is when I remember and I don't remember much before twelve. You know, you, you, you really see a a lot of that lately. That's one, one thing that's been personally bothering me is that far more than you see, than you see the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. You see things like is baptism required for salvation? And you'll see Christians fighting about that or, you know, is water baptism required and all these other once saved, always saved can start an argument in any. Yeah. I mean, and it's just, it's so, it's so frustrating that it, to me, it's clear the intent behind this is it's for content. Um, You want views on your page and that's what you're trying to do. And I don't know about you, but if I was an unbeliever and even had a tinge to look at the Christian community, I wouldn't want to be a part of that. It's pretty clear that the only reason why you're doing this, you're saying out of your mouth that you want them to come to Jesus because you love them. And then whenever they say no, you say, and have help, have fun in hell, buddy. But the intent is pretty clear that you're wanting this for content because that's the engaging stuff. And what did I say in the pre-meeting today? That's the last thing I want to do. Do I want our podcast to get views? Absolutely. But I want it to be authentically doing the will of God, not because I know what people want to see. And so I provide that to you. You know, but the sad reality is it's not just content not just podcasts it's also churches because i i'm a firm believer that if jesus was here today that he would be saying a lot of things today about the church that he did in scripture about the pharisees and the sadducees mm-hmm. and he, he said that they were teaching in essence the the law of god uh equal with of course the traditions of man and that the traditions of man were brought up to the level of importance of the laws of God. And so we've got all of our traditions in the church. And, I, and of course, I I hate what Eric said. Of course, we're Protestant, and that a Protestant put on a Catholic individual's car that they were going to hell. And to me, that's a misrepresentation of our beliefs as Christians. One is we're not the judge of anybody. And the other is, is I really believe that if Jesus were here today, he'd be correcting his church, the church, um, that we're, we're placing emphasis on things that he never intended us to put emphasis upon. He wouldn't be in the unbeliever community correcting them. He would be in here correcting them. I believe he would. I agree completely. Eric, may I ask you how old you are? I am 36. 36. When you said, you know, raised up in the South and Catholic and all that was going on, I, yeah. I imagined you were closer to my age. I, yeah, I was, uh, I haven't been in a church since I was 18, but yeah, I, I, I'm 36 now. So 
So I, what did you what did you do for those um, six years or whatever that you stopped believing at twelve and then you you had to continue going to church from twelve to eighteen? Mom made yeah. him go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom and dad uh, they made me do Sunday school. I even had to be an altar server boy. I mean, it's I did what I I thought was best for them. And did you like, have moments like in there throughout those years where you were like, man, I like where you kind of waved in your belief system or were when that moment that you at 12, when you said you were out, you were out. No, I was out. Yeah. I, I, I would go to Sunday school. I would do it. But like my mind never clicked. That was true as more just like, it would be like you guys learning about, um, Norse mythology or Greek mythology that you just listening to it as like a tale and an idea of what people believe. But you, I didn't like then think, well, these things are being said, but therefore it's true. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. We, we actually, um, we, we interview all towards, uh, sorts of different, um, um, people from different walks of faith. And you'd be surprised what we know about Norse mythology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the yeah. way, by the way, hi beard. Hi fro. Hi beard and fro. Yeah. Uh, we've interviewed, uh, yeah. we've interviewed probably 10 Norse pagans at this point. Yeah, Probably pretty close. Uh, yeah. You'd be shocked at, um, our knowledge of other religions at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we've been doing this a little bit. Did, would you say, ha, ha, so you, you say that you have Christians on you and you talk about, um, you, you debate to an extent. So I, I take it that you've really dived into, um, the Christian religion, um, since, yeah. since deconstructing. Yeah. I, uh, I debate Christian and Islam. They're the two religions I debate. I, I've read the Bible multiple times. I also have read the Quran and the Hadith. I discuss it with uh, people that are very knowledgeable. I have a friend. She has a PhD in theology, and she's a active rabbi. And I also have another friend who's working on his PhD right now, who is a uh, who also I discuss a lot of the religion. I also have a friend who has a master's degree in Quranic, uh, offensive jihad. And I, and some, I have some friends in the Middle East that are ex-Muslim. And so I discuss Christianity and Islam probably daily. Let, let me ask you a question mm-hmm. to, to me, at least from my point of view, it seems like Christianity, and I'm not trying to play the victim of like persecution. I, I don't think I've ever been persecuted for my faith. Um, or anything yeah. like that. So please don't take this as uh, me playing a victim. But I do, when I look at Christianity, it looks like it's for sure under more fire and more scrutiny and more um, um, subject to hatred from outside belief systems and stuff like that than any other religion that exists. Does that not perk your interest a little bit? Or how do you view that? Well, no, I, I so... I'm not an atheist because I disagree with the Bible. I'm an atheist for other reasons. And so the, the, um, when it comes to discussion, like is, if I talk to a Muslim, I just had a discussion because right before I came on this, I did, I was in a live with somebody else about two hours, debating Islam. And the people come up there and say, Islam is the one that's the most attacked religion. And everyone's attacking Islam and nobody attacks Christianity and um, Judaism and it's all them. And so I've, I've learned from this, from debating both religions, is that people see one side and they don't see the others. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I was in a live with 150 people and we, that's all we were discussing was Islam. And, um, they all, uh, I would read the comments all and they say, all you guys talk about is Islam all day. That's all you guys say. That's all that is being attacked. And they it would say, because people are attacking Islam so hard and no, and they think no other religion, they say that tells them that Islam is true. Gotcha. I, I don't draw the conclusion that Christianity is true based off of that. The thing that no, really I, the, the thing that really gets me about Christianity that that really just made me I mean, I remember I remember just like going, whoa, like um the fact that um I think it's Pastor Gary, you'll probably know this, but it's the gospel summed up in First Corinthians where Paul was talking about where 
Jesus died, rose again, and then appeared to over 500 people. 15, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I read that and I go, whoa. Like, there's over 500 people that witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. And we all admit, and I know we'd all admit in the room, and Paul himself admitted that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then this is all a wash. And everybody asks, is there anything, if there is there anything that would make you not be a Christian? And the answer is yes. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'll leave this right now. Mm-hmm. I will take this necklace off and I will denounce anything I've ever done and I'll walk away. But there's a problem when I look at that. The problem is that according to the according to the Bible and according to these eyewitness accounts, there's over five hundred people that laid eyes on this guy after he had risen from the dead, mm-hmm. after being dead for three days. And to me, that goes, whoa. You know what I mean? Um, but like stuff like that doesn't really affect me. The, the stuff of like, um, you know, that uh, the fact that it gets attacked. Because you're right. Um, we haven't really talked to a Muslim on this show yet. We've actually had a hard time. You may you, you may think about this. You may see if you could get one of your Muslim friends on the show. Um, um, because we've never had the chance to speak to one, ever, on this show. Yeah. We've, we've had over 70 episodes. So you may think about it. If they'd be willing to, I'd love to interview one of them. I mean, I can I can discuss it with them. I can Thank tell you, you anything there is because yeah, I I've I've discussed this with them, and so like in their worldview, like so Muslims don't believe Jesus actually was the one on the cross. They believe it was someone else, and that he survived. But they they will refer to so the split in the moon is something they believe. The what now? And they say that the the moon split. They believe Muhammad split the moon and put it back together. And they actually believe there's eyewitnesses. And they actually have the name of the eyewitnesses. And they have, it like, genealogy. And they progress these lines down of, they said, this person saw it, and they have these children, they have these children, they have these children. And they go back to, I believe they have it to modern day today, who the children are that witnessed it. And so they use that. These people saw this. There's documentation, he, like like you know, like we have the scrolls and, and stuff like that, where there's actual documentation. There's documentation of this stuff. It, uh, yeah, it's in their religion that they have it that says that he went up. It's kind of like a donkey that flies and split the moon, and then put it back together, and that they have the names of the people witnessed it and said that they witnessed Muhammad split the moon and put it back together. There's even a story, which I discredit the story, but there's a story of someone in India who witnessed the splitting the moon and put it back together and supposedly traveled all the way to the Middle East to uh, bow to Muhammad, knowing that he was the prophet. Yeah. They they do uh, believe that. And yeah, they, they will actually... Their documentation's really good. Like the Hadiths are like the stories of the life of Muhammad. And they have a chain of narration. And they will look at it for when it was told and it goes all the way down who said it, who did it, all this stuff. And if they see something that like this person doesn't seem to be trusted, they will scrap that, those Hadiths. And they have like two of them that are like, they consider completely authentic. But they supposedly, there's thousands of Hadiths, but supposedly he collected over 100,000. He only, and the, one of the main guys only kept like 4,000 out of 100,000 or something. Supposedly. Hey, er, er, they just don't know where the other ones are, but. Can, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. and, and this is not a setup, it's honestly just a heartfelt question. And that would be yeah. what, what is one of your greatest arguments against Christianity? And and when you debate or when you come against Christianity, what is one of the things that is one of your uh, most negative towards Christianity? Um, it dis- it's distinguishable by which position and who I'm discussing. Like, I discuss evolution a lot. And it, so, like, if I go with the younger creation, I use things like ERVs, which are endogenous retroviruses, which make it through indulgence retroviruses and the age of, at the, the age of the earth and all that. Yeah. The age of yeah. the earth. Mm-hmm. I do discuss this when it comes to younger creation. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I've done like the problem of evil, the hidden God, um, things like this. Cause like, I do like to discuss the philosophical concept of an all powerful, all loving God. Okay. Let's, I, I want to talk that, about that with you. That was going to be my yeah. question. Do you, sure. the, the idea of a personal creator to you, is that something that, something that, that, you know, like we, we believe we have a personal creator that created us with intention. We have a purpose to be here and our purpose is to serve him and we are here for him, by him and for him and that we have a purpose and that is to fulfill that, um, that we have in him. And, you know, he sent his son to die because he loved us um, and he wants a personal relationship with us. And then that someday we can spend eternity with him. Does that, even though, even though you believe it's fake, does that interest yeah. you? Like, if that were true, would that excite you or would it not excite you? Um, if, if it was true, it's one thing. But so there's a de uh, debate part that I go with that it goes with, like, the propositions. The one is God all powerful. He can create a logical universe. Is he all knowing? Does he all know every logical outcome that can go? then I would ask, does God desire for a personal relationship with me? Then I say, does God uh, know what would convince me of him existing? Then, I, then the, the last one is, almost every single person has at least one time openly, heartedly searched to know if God exists. And so with this, I can look at these things and saying that, this God's all powerful. He knows what you want. He knows everything that you that would convince you of his existence. At one time, everyone wants to know if he does exist. And because of this, and he didn't convince us using knowing this thing, it tells me either he doesn't want you to know, he isn't powerful enough to do it, or he wouldn't exist. And so when I reason it this way, using this, dedu uh, this deductive argument, I can point to these things and saying, if these premises are true and this conclusion is true, it would be very difficult to do it because I do ask these questions all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a imperialist that you have to give me diehard evidence. I discuss the philosophy. I have Christians that have like masters and PhDs that I've that debate in big things like Stan and all that, who just did a debate with Matt Dillahunty and we discuss these concepts and I'm extremely reasonable. I just, I, I don't know if some of these philosophical arguments, how they could be answered in a way that I myself could feel satisfied. What about the idea that we're all given the same amount of evidence by God, same amount of evidence since the creation of time, in turn, but, that makes it a choice for everyone. Because would it actually be a choice if God just provided whatever would convince you? Because then it wouldn't be your free will choice to serve him because that's the whole idea. He wants you to want to serve him, right? Sure. And so yeah. what the, the idea of kind of, I'm not trying to get into a free will ar argument here or a free, I'm not trying to no, talk about fine. free will. Yeah. But the idea, not, the idea is that we're yeah. all provided the same amount of evidence. It states that in the book of Romans, I believe that we're all provided the same amount that you're not going to get any more, any less than, than someone, but that um, God draws all men close to him. And so what happens is we're all provided that same evidence. And so you have to actually make that choice to believe. Does that make sense? But are we all provide the same level? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Well, it, just uh, hold on a second. The the base level of evidence of like for for me like and and I know you don't see it this way, and I know there's other arguments about it, mm -hmm. for, but for me, like just the intricacies of the universe and how it's created, and the fact that like, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson was um, talking about this the other day that if the Earth all of a sudden stopped rotating that it's rotating. Yeah, we'd eight, all go. Yeah, we would all yeah. just fly off. That to me, that oh, yeah. these universal constants that cause the, the earth to be perfectly shaped, formed, and be consistently operating in a perfect fashion, that, um, that points me to a designer. And to me, it's almost obvious. You know what I mean? That's like, there's no way that this could all be operating yeah, at a could, perfect standard. 
we could discuss that. But so, the but I, just before we can even wrap the other one in my nice boat, I I know in the Bible there's case scenarios where God Himself presented Himself to like the Israelites when He left. He performed those miracles. There, uh, He He brought His Son for a group of people to perform and things like this. I I mean I have to this day where people said that God has given them a sign and he's done these different things that showed them he exists. And so, and so I would argue saying these people are given special things. I mean, they might have something they consider a miracle be presented in front of them. Yet I studied the scripture. I mean, as I said, I have a friend who has a PhD. She is one of the nicest people. She's a rabbi. She is a Jewish rabbi, and she is an interfaith uh, discusser and discusses and teaches Christianity and uh, PhD level for and tutors students on Old Testament. And uh, I discuss it good faith with really intelligent people. And uh, I think that these people, some people are given more as far as even in history, like seeing Jesus and seeing miracles and people today who have had prayers answered and these miracle things happen. And I, to this day, haven't received. So it would be hard for me to say they have the same level and him knowing. Because I could get convinced. You'd be surprised. If if the right things did, he could convince me. I don't need like him to come down and like tell me. But I want to get um, Larry's perspective yeah. on something that you said. Uh, this question just sure. popped in my head, and then I want to ask you a question after um, after that. Um, okay, so Larry, because you've mentioned this before that you've never had some grandiose God showing up to you on a cloud. You've never had some crazy dream or anything else, but you still attribute everything that happens in your life to God and everything that has happened to your life to God. And you've fully devoted your life and you've served him, but you haven't had some grandiose spiritual encounter with God before, but you still devote your life to him. Can you talk about like why you do that? Even though you haven't received those um, dreams, visions and stuff that you've heard other Christians have. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because he said that he's heard that and in, and I and I know it doesn't bother you either. It doesn't bother you that you don't get that, but you still do. No, I don't. I I never have had. I I feel the hand of God continuously in my life. I know when I'm operating within His will. Um, I have, you know, for lack of better words to understand, I have that feeling inside of me. I have a drive, and that every one of you can agree with. That is kind of unique and pushes me quite a bit, but it all comes from time in the word. And the Bible says that there, there are people that are going to read it like a book and not have a relationship with it. I have a relationship with my Bible. I know where to turn to certain things. I, and it's not from knowledge because I don't, I couldn't argue with him. You know, um, I couldn't argue with you, Eric on, what what chapter, what verse, you know, this was said or that was said because my memory doesn't work that way. But I have the word inside me, and several times I have been witnessing or talking with somebody that wisdom comes from what I've had in, in me, given to me, not from my head, but from my soul. And I don't have any memory of reading that particular book scripture or that particular verse but it god has given me a word for somebody and through that i am amazed when it is received in the way that it was intended so you you're saying you have a you have a deep personal connection with god but it's not something that was just given to you some that you pursued i pursued yes yes when i came to the lord in 17 I feel like I was baptized. I mean, I know I was baptized at that men's conference by the Holy Spirit. I know at that particular point, Matthew six thirty three was placed in me. Yeah, and 
And you we, went we've with gotten it. through your classes, Gary. My wife made a comment the other day when we were talking about worry, and you said, you know, raise your hand if you worry. Can you tell Eric and what I Matthew... don't worry at all about anything because I know God is in control. I don't, I'm not in control of anything. Can you tell Ma- uh, Eric what Matthew 6.33 is? Matthew 6.33 is, Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. Okay. I don't worry about what the, all those things are. I know that God will provide for me. For instance, this morning, I got up with nothing on the books to do today. But I came and got my crew, made a phone call, and I had work. Nice. And I had work enough to, you know, and then since I got, you know, several phone calls, it was unexpectedly timed, okay? Um, But I got up in faith. I didn't sit in my chair, which I could have. I've had a hard week. Like, you know, we had vacation Bible school last week, so I was on the on the go all week. I was exhausted. Uh, Monday was uh, uh, torturous, and it's hot. And today, I, I made a you know quick phone call on the way to pick up the guys, and it's like an affirmative. Come on out! So I grabbed the equipment and head, and I come back in, and and you know. God directing my path is what I set my day out for. I spend my time with, with the Lord in the morning. I, I often don't have answers, but I step out. And God has directed me continuously ever since I made it that part of my life. I just seek God. He'll direct me, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Okay. Eric, um, my question now. I'm surprised I didn't forget yeah. it. Um, I'm surprised I didn't mm-hmm. forget it. Um, okay. So you said that you said that God would know what would need to convince you, but I want to know from Eric, what's your line in the sand? What would God need to do to convince you? Like, do you have a line in the sand? Like, I want to know what God could do right now to convince you that he's real. I want to say I do, but I don't know exactly what it is because I think there is multiple ways that could convince me. Give me one. I, I, give me something to pray for. Uh, a philosophical argument that proves to me that there has to be this, and all of God does exist. Okay, I, here's, and see, here's I couldn't keep up. see Eric. I'm and I'm not. A, I'm not a debater, and I'm not an arguer, but I am vocal. Yeah. Okay, and but I I don't understand how you can look at just the un just the earth in its position in the universe and not see that there has to be a creator, but you can look yeah, at I a, you can that. look at a painting and know that there was an artist. And I know yeah. that's a, I know that's a lame argument, but no, in, no. in all I, honesty and all, it. in all honesty and all truth for me, I, I was raised in the church and I walked away at 18 because you know, my mom made sure I went to church just like you. And I lived my life, and I came back to the Lord in 2017. So that was a lot of years without following after the Lord. But looking back, I see everywhere he directed me, even though I wasn't living for him, every time that he saved me and I wasn't living for him, every time that he – so I know my mom's prayers were answered, right? But at the same time, I never, through everything I went through, I never actually doubted that there was a God. My brother, on the other hand, is an agnostic. Yeah, we interviewed his brother on the show, still an unbeliever to this day. Episode six, yeah. actually, was his brother. Um, okay, do you have a response to anything he said there, Eric? Yeah, yeah, of course. So when it looks at the universe, we have, we have an issue. The universe is the only one that we know of. And so when it comes to, like, is this universe created or not, of course we know paintings, how paintings happen. So a way I give an example is this. If I'm walking down a creek and I see this creek is dammed, how do I figure out if this creek is dammed by beavers or if it was dammed by um, natural causation, just branches and stuff falling? Okay. And so the way to do that is I look for evidence. Is uh, there a little beaver footprint, chew marks, things like this? If there is, I can say, yeah, beavers did this. If it's if it just broken twigs and stuff, that would show natural causation. But the way I can know this 
is because I'm comparing the two, knowing how one of them works, and then saying this is how this goes. The issue with the universe is that there is only one. So I don't know what the marks would be for a creation. And even when we discuss like the Earth. So through uh, astronomy, I discussed this with the astronomer, and that so the livable zone for where Earth is is actually between Mars and Venus. If the planet Earth was to shift a thousand miles in one direction, it would still be able to support life. Knowing this, that the planet can still be moved, and that even with the rotation of it, most planets rotate. And the reason they rotate is from when a planet is created, which you can watch. They're, they're struck by meteorites, which causes eventual rotation. And so we can look at Jupiter. It rotates. And we have been able to look at other planets that are extremely far away, so we'll never be able to visit them. And we're able to use concepts of like light to determine what kind of ozone layer some of these planets have. And last time I looked, I think it was about 27 planets that are in the habitable zone that look as they have liquid water, which are the two necessary things for life. We'll probably never know if it does. But we even looking at, uh, there is a moon around Jupiter. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, uh, uh, Titan, that has three times as much liquid water as Earth does. And we're sending a satellite there. And I don't think there's going to be like uh, aliens coming out that are going to be flying UFOs coming and attacking us. But there could be simplistic life. And it actually, the warmth and the liquid water has more liquid water than our Earth does. So when I hear this, are we just the chance that we struck a lottery that our planet's in the habitable zone and over time this is where we're at? It'd have to be more than one lottery. That's my thing. It'd have to yeah, be like but, a, a... But the amazing, the amazing thing with your, your uh, argument in this case is mm-hmm. that you're, I've heard just the opposite. I've heard it, sure. if the Earth rotation was a little bit slower, that we'd you know basically fall off, or if it was a little bit more, then the gravity pull would be so much that we wouldn't even be able to move. I've heard that if we, you know, but I'm not a man of science. I'm not a learned man. Yeah. I I do believe that there is a reason that in eleven or Hebrews eleven one talks about faith it's the essence you know faith is the essence of things hoped for without evidence everybody wants all the evidence but it requires faith and faith means that you don't get to see it you don't get to touch it you don't get proof but you believe in it and actually eleven six, i believe says that without faith you can't even please god Eric, do you think it's silly to believe in God? Like, would you? How do you look at me as a Christian? Do you think it's? Do you think I'm just like have some sort of weakness or? No, 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 no. So I think. So I discuss this. I actually get upset with atheists if they try to do some kind of straw man. I actually do believe you have for yourself good justification to believe God exists. Hey, I want to say and, this. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, that means I a lot. Agree. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I actually, I've actually got on a live. This this had like 300 something people on it. And someone came on the live and it was an atheist who was being hateful. And he tried to say that he thinks uh, religion was like a mental disease or something. And I got on the live and I cursed them out. And I said, the acceptance of the belief that you think something's true. That isn't something like that. I, I don't think anyone on either side should think that someone is like, a lesser person because they accept this as true or not. I think you do believe because you have been convinced and I just haven't. And that is the the difference is what you see. I just have like, they call it epistemology, a way of finding truth. And yours came to God is true. My epistemology said God isn't true. And I think that is, 
and see the difference. That doesn't make either uh, worse. Uh, yeah. Eric, this is Gary. And I think the difference a lot is that, like you said, we're convinced that it is true. And yeah. the thing that, and, and I appreciate your position in, in the way you look at Christians, and I, I really do. But the thing about, of course, me personally, and I think most of us here in the room, is it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that convinced us. It's not the intellect, it's not the philosophy, it's not the science, but it's just I personally know Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior, and I have a very personal relationship with him, and he gives me peace, he gives me joy, he gives me contentment in life, and he gives me a promise of eternal life past this life, and it all revolves around just being convinced in that very personal relationship with him. And you, and it comes from a devotion and a personal time with actually spending time with him. It's not just something that came to you overnight, right? No. And it's, yeah. and it's a, a love relationship. Like, like Friday this week, I'll be married to my wife 50 years Ooh. and that's forever. But a uh, 50 year marriage, of course, you, Congratulations. thank you. And with 50 years, of course, I know her pretty well. She knows me pretty well. And we, we still don't, uh, I still learn things every day, but at the same time, w- we've been together for a long time, and and it's the same with the Lord. I've been with the Lord longer than I have my wife, and I know know Him, and I have a personal relationship with Him, and He knows me. And one of my constant prayers is, is you know, I I thank you, Lord, that you know me and that I know you, and and we can walk this life together. And so it's just a very, very much like marriage, a very personal intimate relationship i love it yeah okay um well go ahead eric go ahead before we go in the rounds you go ahead and do your response right there yeah and i understand this and so like i I tell people like you'll never see me knocking on the door with a math book saying have you heard the great word of atheism i think (laughs) that one thing i've discussed that i promote critical thinking more than anything else and I've actually stopped alive when a person has come to me and says, you know, I think that if I don't believe in God, then I don't know if I could live. And I said, you know, I'm not going to discuss this with you no more, that I want you to keep believing. And I, this is about discussions and topics. And I have a 16-year-old daughter that I don't talk about religion. I promote critical thinking. And if she becomes a Christian, she becomes a Christian. If she doesn't, she doesn't. But I just want her to get there with her own thinking. And so that's important to me. The the way Pastor Gary just described his personal relationship with God, is that something that you wish that you could have? Do you feel like it's something that you kind of long for, but you just can't wrap Mm. your head around it? No, I don't. I'm actually pretty happy with my life. I don't. Fair enough. Yeah, I've actually, yeah, I've helped probably hundreds of people stay out of prison. I've, I've had people who've messaged me who've gotten better place in life. I, I, uh, discuss with women who have been abused, um, and help promote things like this. I educate people. I've got people to work on being more educated and studying, going back to school and, I've helped people who at one time really thought they would be drug addicts for the rest of their life and got them to not do that no more. And so I think that uh, I I feel very fulfilled with the things I do. And what you do? Fair enough. Okay. Um, We're going to do the rounds. Um, Coco, first. I can get my mic on. Yeah, (laughs) unmute your mic, please, (laughs) sir. Eric, I just um, I want to thank you for coming on. This has been one of the more interesting conversations, I think, from my perspective. We've Same. Had in a while. I yep. I was going to say, I don't know if everybody would agree with me or not. Yeah, I but, do. I do. But yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I just wanted to let you know, they were talking about um, maybe getting us in touch with one of your Muslim friends. Um, I'm going to reach out to yeah. Tamara after this, but if you can kind of point them her direction, she's the one that's doing... Well, you know, she's the one doing all our scheduling now. You were the one, in, you were in touch with her. Yeah. So um, if you wouldn't yeah. mind, um, you know, if there's anybody you think might be a good fit for the show that... Link us up, yeah. Yeah, get us, get them pointed towards uh, Tamara. That would help us out a lot. Yeah, I could discuss it with them. I have 
six or seven ex Muslims I discussed that live in the Middle East. So cool. Thank you. We'd love that, Angela. I was just kind of curious if you've had any um, spiritual thing happen, like to you, or just like anything in general. No. No. Never. Okay, there you go. The simple answer to that. <laughs> Wasn't much you're looking for there, huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, Larry, go ahead. Eric, I appreciate you uh, coming on and talking with us. Um, I actually enjoyed the conversation. I, I tend to get a little bit uh, gruff at times, and I, I apologize if that came across in my tone. No. But I typically read a verse. Is uh, Are you okay with that? Absolutely. All right. I've got John fourteen twenty seven. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Okay. Is that it? You know? Oh, you oh you muted my mic because I was drinking. Sorry. Okay. Was I being distracting? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I got it. I read it. I appreciate it. Oh, that was it. Okay. That was right. it. Pastor Gary? Hey, Erica, I appreciate your relationship with Christians and the way that uh, your position of not being critical or uh, coming against, being anti, and appreciate that very much. And I really love what you said about your daughter. Of course, I've raised two girls, and, and as daddy of girls, I think it's great that you're going to let her make her own choices and, and have that critical thinking of what is right and wrong and what is uh, her way. And so that's wonderful. Yeah. And I want to say it's great to meet you and great to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you. Okay, my turn. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little weird, okay? I'm going to get a little weird. Bear with me. Um, I'm actually, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm also one of those Christians. One of those roll your eyes at Christians, okay? And what I mean by that is, so I saw I saw a video this week, and I'm going to help describe it because I'm going to get you an idea of what I'm asking for here, okay? So I saw a video this week, and I don't know if this videos are true. I'm just using it as an example. I'm not claiming to know that that to believe that this video is true. No, that's my play toy. <laughs> I, I, I'm not claiming to believe this video is true or anything. I have no knowledge. I have no clue who this guy is, but I'm using it as an example. So in this video, this guy describes how he went up to a kid on campus and he was an atheist and he said, hey, if I could pray for something today to get you to believe in God, what would it be? And I'm, par I'm shortening this story way down. And he said, um, the atheist told him, he said, you know what? Um, I haven't talked to my mom since I was like six years old. If my mom called me right now, before you ended ended this prayer and said she was sorry to me, I would I would give my life to God right now. And he said, okay, I mean, what do we have to lose? Well, we're going to pray for it right now. And so he prayed for it. Sure enough, mom calls him and apologizes to him. And the kid ended up giving his life to the Lord right there. Like I said, I have no clue if that true, if that story is true. Um, but I, like I said, I am one of those Christians. And I do believe that God still works miracles today. And if you could think of something along those lines, you have nothing to lose to where I could pray for something. I'm not going to pray right now because I'm not going to put you on the spot like that. I know you didn't come on here expecting that. So I'm not going to ask to pray for you right now. Unless you wanted me to, I would. I'd be more than willing to pray for you right here, right I now. Don't, I, if you want to, that's fine with me. Uh, I make the joke that like I'd rather have as many different gods on my side than none at all. Yeah, I, I have okay. never had an issue with someone praying for me. Give me something I can pray that 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 would convince you that if God made it happen, and I'm not talking about a million dollars or anything oh, like that. I don't know. Give yeah, me something. I, I wish. I wish I. It, the bad part is, I don't know off the top of my head. Like, I am it, it, it definitely off the top of my head. I I wouldn't be able to say. Is there I a relationship you. you want repaired? Is there something in your life that you wish got better? Is there? I mean, is there an obstacle in your way that you, you wish that you know that you need some help with? I mean, what, what is there something, or is your life just peachy keen? It's all good. It's. It's a case scenario that it's, I wouldn't say it's peachy keen, but it is a case scenario that I don't know if, if like, let's say I was like, Hey, pray that I get a the better job calls me. And like two days later, a better job calls me, but I've also been putting application. I've, I was putting applications in and I would just say, does that, is it from God or that? I guess that wouldn't I, raise your I, eyebrow. 
If if you had no. to pray to get a better job and a better job called you in two days and it was this outstanding, crazy job where you're happy for the rest of your life, the next 20 years, and you can't just believe how happy you are and how it just popped out of yeah. nowhere, that wouldn't convince you? No, and the issue is because if I put in 15 applications, it, it goes to this situation. Was it because I put those in or was it because of God? And I don't know. Gotcha. And does that make sense? Fair. No, it's fair enough. I, I just if something if something was there and you had it, I would pray for you. Just just know. Yeah, you know, I know. I, I that's always you. that's always there. How about that? I'll leave that open. You can message me on the help my unbelief. It, it's always there, and I would never tell anybody that you asked me to pray for you. Because, uh, but I, I do appreciate um, you saying that. That that really made me feel relieved because a lot of times we don't get that from the atheist community that you respect our beliefs. You don't feel like we're silly and delusional and stuff like that. So, oh yeah, that actually I meant don't... a lot. And this was actually a really fun conversation to have with you. Like you're very down to earth, level headed, and so it was a lot of fun. I appreciate so, it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. And and actually, the floor is yours. Um, the the final word is yours. Yeah, and I said I do appreciate you guys discussing with me. I do, I'm very glad that we had that conversation. If there's ever another time you guys want to have a conversation, uh, you guys know where to get me. I do want to say uh, thank you, Rabbi Hana, GT. They're two really good friends of mine um, for helping me with stuff. And uh, I my friends in the ex-Muslim community, M, Lone Rider, Lamise, and all them. And... Um, even like the fil- my filt bros and all that stuff. I do appreciate everybody with the path I've taken in life. And I do appreciate you guys even listening to me and discussing it and being very cordial and allowing, allowing me to express what I think yeah. without thinking I'm evil or being loud about it. I, I do appreciate that. Yep. And so thank you so much. No problem, Eric. Okay, brother. We'll talk. We'll, we'll talk again. All right. I appreciate it. All right. Thank take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you go. Y'all got, hey, I got to have my vices. Y'all got to quit griping at yeah, me. Right in there. It, Is it bad? It's always so whole, loud. I'd rather you go back to chewing even, gum. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Got it's it. Like, Did you clack, hear him? Clack, clack. It's like, clack, clack. Coco's giving me permission. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't really know what we could talk about with that conversation without it sounding like, you know, sounding like we were like, so we may just move off of it. We don't it, want to be negative at all. Yeah, I, got, I, I got a question that maybe kind of relates to something he talked about. When okay. he talked about he went to church from 12 to 18 as a, as a non-believer, essentially. Yeah. What do you think the chances are that there's someone here um, that's like that? Quite Churches a few. are full I, of them. I think yeah, full of yeah, them. Full yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, you remember well, you remember that's Lindsay way of um it. Lindsay, right? That she she wasn't really like saying she doubted her faith, but like, you know, she definitely was experiencing church in a different way that we that than we were. You know, Lindsay um you know who I'm yeah, talking yeah, about, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, you, you think it's full of them here? Oh, yeah. I, I think yeah, it's hard. Yeah, like yeah. no, because for here it be, would be hard. No, because I was raised, there, there was no choice but to go to church. You're living in my house, you're under 18, I'm the ruler, my mom, and you're going to church. There's no question. So that, that, that mindset was set in my formative years. I didn't even question that I had to be at church. When I started getting assigned to Sundays, my mom said, nope, you either quit your job or they change your hours. Period. Here, my perspective on it, why I think it would be difficult here, and maybe we can banter about this a little bit, because, like, I've came here to church every week, never missed a week while I was doubting my faith, and there's some people that are very in tune with the Spirit of God in here that God's talking to them and telling them, like, Pastor Didi walked up to me one time Mm -hmm. and said some stuff that blew blew my hair back. I mean, it's still the craziest thing that I have ever had experienced ever is I was literally, <laughs> I wish Pastor Gary wasn't here, but it's fine <laughs> because he's involved in the story. That's I'm just okay. going to talk about That's okay. it. okay. So I was in church one day and I literally was about to make a beeline out the door. I was just, I was in that really doubting period in my life. And I was just so disgruntled at God and the process of going down to the altar and praying 
And I was sitting there in my head, and Angela was down there being her good little servant self, perfect. I'm perfect. My name's Angela, you know. <laughs> She's uh, <laughs> Always obedient to God, you know. <laughs> anyway, but um, she, she you really, go, girl. You she go, really girl. Like that. Be but the example. She's down there praying and stuff like that, you know. And I'm I'm back in the seats, and I'm I have an eye on Pastor Gary. Make sure he doesn't see me because I know my face is probably like, Ugh! and I I know that there's people here that's gonna see this, and I know that it wouldn't be let slide. And so I just kind of tried to make my face as best as I could, and I started talking to God in my head, and I said, God. I'm not doing this praying crap anymore. I'm not going down to the altar anymore. I'm not giving in things to you. Not, none of this works. I'm done. I give up. And when I said that, I walked out. Pastor Didi's backing her car out in the parking lot, slams on her brakes, gets out of her car, and walks up to me and says, you're going to think I'm crazy, but God told me to tell you to not stop going down to the altar, not to stop praying. And I go, I'm going... Like, and I'm start, and I'm not, I'm not thinking like crying or anything like that. I'm sitting here going, did I say that out loud in there? Was I that <laughs> upset? Like, I was like, and, and I told her, I was like, did you tell her? She's like, tell her what? And then I'm, I'm like, oh my God, that was in my head. I didn't tell Angela. She was down at front because I'm starting to like go through these boxes because it was so strange. I'd never had anything like that happen before. And so I'm saying all this to bring up a point that that happened when I was in the lowest point of my life and God loves me so much that he used other people that aren't in that point to reach me in a, one of the lowest days I've ever had ever. So what I'm saying is I just find it hard to believe that somebody in this church with a bunch of spirit filled believers that could go that long without God pinging somebody off. And reaching out to him. I find it hard to believe. Okay. Do you really think it's possible? Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like Sunday, I gave an altar call Sunday for salvation. And I only had one this Sunday. And in the back was a lady that held up her hand. And, I mean, she it's one of them held up her hand. And and then she held it up and, and kept it up. And I said, no, it's okay now. You, you can put your hand in. But she just wanted to keep it up for some reason. And she had a Christian T-shirt on. And she had attended the church for some, evidently, some time. And that was her time. She was ready to sell out and make Jesus Lord. There's a difference between Jesus being Savior yes. and being Lord. Totally different. 100%. Yeah. And some people attend church just to, for fire escape to miss hell. But then they come to the place of wanting to make Jesus Lord of their lives. And that's the difference. We've all came there before. We've we've all reached that decision before. And there have been times, honestly, over the years that I've given altar calls and I've for salvation I've had people hold up their hand and I w- was sitting there thinking, Oh wait, that's a deacon. He's getting saved today. You know? That that's somebody that's attended this church twenty years. Yeah. You know, and I go, Wait okay, are you sure you know what I'm asking? You know? And they're holding their hand for salvation. Yeah. So do you uh, think some of that, that, that maybe they just backslid and they're rededicating or the thing I've learned is I don't ask questions. You all, don't care. All yeah. I, all I do is preach, present, give the opportunity for salvation. That's not your call. job, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And let the Holy spirit convict and draw. I remember when I got baptized, there was a lady that was getting baptized and I, I just remember pastor Kevin was baptizing people and he asked the lady, he goes, isn't, isn't this like your third time? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, I wasn't going to say that. No, but okay. <laughs> oh, oh. but I, said, um, I, I said, he said, isn't this your third time? He's like, yeah. And he's like, well, okay. Well. And, he, and he did it anyway. He didn't yeah. ask questions. He's yeah. like, you know. And yeah. I was just like, I laughed because he, di- he didn't ask her. He mm-hmm. didn't tell her, hey, stop doing this. He didn't. You know, he just did Whatever it, it takes. <laughs> yep. Maybe it was the T-shirt. I don't know. I, I get what you're saying, and I know it's possible. And maybe I'm putting too much, um, what do you say, stature on the church that this is some... Um, you know, I, I don't know. I really do feel like this is a church that's and I like think that's different. great to have that yeah. attitude towards the church. I think well, it's let great. Me, let me address the question. Coco said between 12 and 18. And everything that you mentioned is an adult that's yeah. on their own free will to come to church. Yeah. There are kids that are still being brought here by their parents as a sense of duty. And then there's also kids in that same age group that come here even though their parents do not. 
I was yeah. say there's probably at least a handful of them that come here just for like the free babysitting, like Wednesday nights, date night, drop the kids off at church, and we're going down to Chili's or Longhorn, yeah, or Cracker Barrel. Kevin likes to say, go to Walmart, go to Walmart, that's go to, always go shopping. Right? Yeah. Well, and then I, I also, I'm also under the understanding that, like, for example, my 15 year old daughter Keegan. Dude, she's anointed her voice right now that when she sings and, and she's doing worship in the over there, it is crazy. Like she is anointed. But I also know for a fact that she hasn't came to the point to where she has made her own physical decision to devote her life to God. She plays the she does she does all the things. Great. She do, I mean, you should see the notes she takes in sermons. Mm-hmm. I mean, I ask her every time we get out of Wednesday church, what'd you learn today? And she always has a well thought out response mm-hmm. for me every single week. You know what I mean? And she has given her life to the Lord, but we all have to, as adults, come to that point. There's there's separate levels to and, it. You and know? I could tell you as a youth pastor at youth camp, um, we had to clean out a lot of luggage of stuff cigarettes, you know, marijuana, nunchucks, I mean, just nunchucks. Guns. Yeah. Like yeah, one guy of these in my things room. doesn't belong here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was in I was going down a list that was in my room and that that was literally in my room. And uh and they weren't Christians. You know, they went to youth camp and they were there because they had to be. They were made to be there. Yeah. And so there is a lot. I do force my daughters to go to church. I do. I will say I do force my daughters to go to church. Like it is a rule. It's a demand. But I also like don't feel like it's a force. Like I know there's been nights before where we were, and I didn't feel this way growing up. There have been nights where we were sick. And I mean, we go to church almost every, probably, you know, 48 weeks a year, you know, and there's a couple nights where we're sick or something. And we're like, we're not going to go tonight. Keegan's like, excuse me. Like she's upset. She wants yeah. to go. You know, so and there's nothing wrong with saying I make my kids go to church. Yeah, I don't think there's anything. You I make don't think eat, so either. You make them take vitamins, make them take a bath, mm-hmm. make them eat green beans, and the reality is, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, if they stay home, we're not going to reach them. Yeah. You know, and, if, if, if you're if they, a believer, if you believe this stuff is true, you better force your kids. You better to go to church because the the fact is, is it, you're I accountable. Can, I can guarantee you we're not going to reach your kids if you don't bring them to church. Yeah. I can guarantee you. No. But if you bring them, there's a possibility that at some time the Holy Spirit's going to make their heart tender and they're going to receive something that's going to change their lives. And so... Teach a child in the way it will go and it won't soon depart its the way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I departed the way as quick as I could. Yeah. I mean, I got married to prove the point, you know, at 18 years old. But the minute... That I got to the end of myself, it took a few years. Yeah. I will say it was important during that conversation. It was important. That's the reason why I asked you that, because it is important that um, that some people don't have that. Like, we interviewed Haley, and she was in that sensory deprivation tank, and Jesus came to her in this bold vision, reached out his hand, and she physically felt hand, Jesus' hand. And then, like, that's almost not free will. Like who is not going to give their life to Jesus at that point? I'm not saying it's not free will and she didn't give her heart to God, but not everybody gets that. No, not everyone gets that, but it is still possible to have just as strong, if not stronger of a connection with Jesus without some profound vision, dream experience, feeling. Well, I listen, I listened to that. What the, the, points that you were making on that because and I and I kind of doubted it just a tad bit because when God came to me I mean Jesus actually said you know hey he didn't say hey I clearly heard quit smoking right I clearly heard do you trust me that was I mean that was to the point I was driving the truck going down the highway cigarette just lit out of a fresh pack and I knew nobody was in my truck with me, but I, I still glanced that way. That's how vivid I heard it. Instantly knew who it was. Instantly. But I thought it was like, I don't know, I knew that I had heard it here, not here. And so, I mean, I was like, well, you know, he also told me to be still and know, you know, several different times. 
be still when I was praying about Darcia. And I was wanting to, I wanted to see the results right now, and there, that wasn't happening. God told me, be still. And I know I heard that Yeah, in my heart. I just think it's important. I, I think it's super important that, that like to make sure that's known is that a not saying you, you don't get to heaven by works. Jesus, Jesus no. is the way to heaven. I'm not, I'm not saying this is the way to salvation, but a deep connection with Jesus and those spiritual encounters is oftentimes it's developed by you and you and, my, and me by our personal connection. Right, it's, it's, it's all about relationship. Developed. Yeah, it, it really does. It comes down to relationship. Yeah, and well, we have to make you know, that choice to step out. Not he's not going to show up to you while you're living in the world. I mean, faith comes from hearing, and if you're not putting mm-hmm. anything in, you can't expect God to show up. You can't. I mean, even at the point in my walk, which I'm nowhere near where Gary is, um, I'm still trying to learn stuff. I'm I, I trust in the God fully. I depend on God fully. Every morning, it's, here I am, Lord, use me today. And I get those opportunities all through the day that I see a, an actual time to share him with someone. Or even if I am sharing him without ever saying a word. Okay? I know that sounds weird, but I do. The lifestyle. And it's it's amazing to me. But at the same time, I I question why can't I be a Didi? Why can't I be a Heather? Yeah. Why can't I be? Am I really that weak? No. Because I think I'm bold, but at the same time, I don't get revelation for someone or walk up. And then at the same, I just said that, and God just showed me one this this weekend. He did do that to me. Mm-hmm. So I was I'd, praying I'd with a, I was a praying with a couple at El Reno. It's just weird and he that he gave me the and words. I'd say there's other people them. saying I can't be a Larry. Yeah, there's a lot of people probably that are like mm-hmm. that. No, they're yeah. probably going. I'm glad I'm not a Larry. No, that's me. <laughs> I'm personally glad I'm not a Larry. No, I'm kidding. No, like I um I like your boldness and stuff like that. Like I, you know, when I go out, when we go out together and we do faith stuff and stuff like that, I hope that. I want you to see my growth and stuff like that. I look at you as like a spiritual leader of sorts of, of to me, you know, I, I'm like, man, I want Larry to see him doing better and stuff like that. So I don't think I want to be like you, but I do want you to be proud of me. I don't want, you know what I you mean? To, I don't want you to want me to be impressed by you. I don't think I impressed want is you the word, but. to want God to be impressed by you. Yeah. If you do everything for the glory of God and you make that your sole purpose each day is to glorify God in everything that you do, whether it be a roof or whether it be fixing a tire for somebody on the side of the road or going and visit somebody in a hospital or go visit somebody or take them some food because they've been homebound for a week, you know, just go take them a meal, spend 30 minutes talking with them. That glorifies God. Yeah. I want you to see my growth, I should say. Hold on, I'm going to say this. I was going to make a joke earlier, but it's really kind of not a joke. But I've always kind of wondered this because kind of Heather Heather and Dee Dee have came up and told me like personal details about my life, essentially. And I've kind of kicked around a few jokes in my head and I'm like, seems like they're always women that kind of God has given these personal details about. And I told Angela, I said, Angela, I do, I do believe God has given you the same gift with that. But the reason why you're not getting them right now is I believe that God has to be able to trust you with personal details of people live and that you're not going to go around gossiping. And it just shocks me that he does that with women because they gossip way more than men. That was your joke? Yeah. I'm just surprised more men know, don't get I've that. I've known a whole lot of guys <laughs> that talk to yeah, women. Yeah. And then I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute. Guys yeah, you're gossip yeah, quite nope, a bit. Yeah. You know, you know I... Pastor Gary, help Sorry. us out with this. Uh, is it is it the men um, lack the necessary boldness in that manner? Yeah. Like, I'm afraid of being wrong, or I'm afraid that that's yeah. not God. Or I mean, because truthfully, shouldn't it be men that give a, a, message, a, in a message in tongues? I mean, I've only known two since I've been in this church where it was a man that actually gave the message. Can I ask you a question real quick? 
Have you ever felt the impression to give a message in tongues and service and not done it? I don't feel like I have. I have. One time. Because I remember Coco, <laughs> what we were sitting there one day, and I was sitting there by him and you his son. You know when I get up, I'm bopping you, right? And you were you were sitting there. Mm -hmm. You were sitting there, when, and I told you right when it happened, too, because I was like, I started praying to God. I said, I said, God, please do a message in tongues today because a lot of times it's very edifying. Like it's what, like when they do it and then it's translated and it's like, it's very edifying. I love it. And I felt God say, you do it. And I was like, no, sir. <laughs> 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 to, a, to answer the question um, in scripture, the emphasis was on man, the new Testament. Yes. And Luke is the one that focuses uh, on the ladies that helped and walked with Christ and, aided in his ministry but there was very few uh in relationship to men and if you remember with me when in acts when they talk about the growth of the church of course the first day there was three thousand added and then later it says and the number of men came to five thousand and it's focused upon the men there was this many men that accepted the lord so <laughs> in the very beginning the emphasis was men over the years the sad reality is Men, macho, to be a Christian is was viewed as a weakness, as an inferiority, as a crutch. Um, that's the culture that I grew up in. My dad was not a Christian, and it was one of those things that, you know, me and my mother went to church, and it was a sissy thing to go to church. And, and it really went from being male-focused to female-focused. And, of course, God's going to use somebody. He's going to use a willing vessel whoever's there and willing to be used. And the sad reality is, is well, thank God for the women, but to me it's sad that it had to be women because men weren't there. So you think it's a sociological issue? A lot of it is, but I also say it's cultural. Yeah. But I see it change now. Yeah. Like I see now in our culture today, men are getting to be more um, confident, in their masculinity, mm -hmm. not as weak and insecure in their masculinity of so what you I would see say it. in the 50s. You, you remember the 50s and the 60s, and it was always trying well, to... Well, I remember the 60s, but I don't remember yeah. the 50s. So you see well, it Well, I've, I've studied the culture a lot. Of course, I was born in the 50s, but I remember, uh, of course, the... Uh, Oh, the motorcycle jackets oh, and yeah. the tough guy yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, the Fonzie and, you know, and all, all of that, you know, yeah. being tough and, you know, show no emotion. and The Thunderbirds. Yeah, yeah I'm tough yeah. and uh, all of that garbage. Um, well, I knew the culture. That's the culture. Yeah, I just wasn't there. So you yeah. think it's yeah. going to change <laughs> soon? I didn't know it, it firsthand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think it's going to change soon then? I believe it's it changing now. Yeah, me too. Like, I'm I'm definitely um, I'm definitely becoming more um, confident with my spirituality day by day. Like, whenever God tells me to do something, no matter how crazy it is, like in public and stuff like that, I still don't feel comfortable, like, screaming out in tongues in church. I'm like, can't we practice at home for a little mm -hmm. bit? Like First, first, first up, I don't think you scream. I think the Holy Spirit projects your voice like mine yeah i project i am but at the same time i don't have to really scream it um to be heard i dd doesn't scream she doesn't i don't think she has the her control over the volume she's projecting i yeah. think i think that the holy spirit projects it because it's for the church and it, he, he knows where he is right and I think Heather's in the same same boat. When she gives a, a, a speaking in tongues, I don't think that she has to scream, you know, physically scream. I think that the Holy Spirit projects their voice because you. I know both ladies very well, and uh, I I I know their nat natural tone. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I mean, I was sitting here thinking, and I guess I was wrong because the Lord really has several times use me to speak into somebody and I knew it was the Lord using me and my wife is has grown into that as well she has she has spoken into several ladies lives and she she'd tell me you know well the Lord told me to tell them you know so it's the confidence that we know that the Lord is speaking but at the same time there is a feeling 
when the Holy Spirit is upon you, that you cannot deny that it's the Holy Spirit. Why would you shy away from it? Yeah. You should step into it. Because to step into it and to be used by the Lord is the most crucial thing that we can do in, right. our, in our relationship. Is That's all through total obedience. Gotcha. Um, time? Uh, we're at 152. 152. Okay. I, I want to read this real okay. quick. Okay. It says, the man who concentrates on the root system of his life is going to bear fruit upward. Say that again, please. The man who concentrates on the root system of his life is going to bear fruit upward. What does that mean? Oh, but, okay, I get it now. Okay. But if he concentrates on the eye-appealing foliage, he may end up a rootless failure. There you go. If you're deeply rooted into Christ... You will bear fruit. The Bible tells us that. But if you're concerned about what you're going to look like as a Christian, then you're not really embedding your root. Right. Okay. Anybody got anything closing? In closing? No? I'm good. All right. I thought that was a pretty good close. Very good. <laughs> All right. Give us it. Jesus loves you and so do I. Thanks for watching and listening. We're out. Thank you for watching or listening all the way to the end. Check back once a month for new episodes. And also check out HMU Testimonies right here on the HMU Network.